Good morning, members of the committee, Angela Kleist, committee staff. The bill before you is second substitute House Bill 1433 relating to energy labeling of residential buildings. For background, the home's energy score was developed by the U.S. Department of Energy to provide homeowners, buyers, and renters directly comp comparable and credible information about a home's energy use. The home energy score report estimates home energy use, associated costs, and provides energy solutions for cost effectively to cost effectively improve the home's efficiency. Under the bill before you, there are two main components. One, by June 30th, 2024, Commerce must adopt by rule the asset-based U.S. Department of Energy home energy score as the primary home energy performance scoring system by which a person may assign a residential building score for the purpose of evaluating the energy efficiency and relative greenhouse gas emissions of the building. And second, by June 30th, 2025, the Department of Licensing in cooperation with Commerce must adopt rules and establish a procedure for the licensing of home energy assessors that will be conducting home energy assessments. And then beginning March 1st, 2026, a person may not hold themselves out as an acting in the capacity of a home energy assessor within the state without first obtaining a license. However, if they're licensed in another state or they have a certif other certifications that meet the requirements or exceed Washington state licensing program that can apply. A fiscal note is available indicating approximately 558,000 impact to the 2023-25 biennium. And with that, I will conclude my remarks. Any questions for staff before we begin? All right, Rep. Dewar, welcome. Thank you very much for having me and for hearing my bill. So uh, this bill would require uh, the Department of Commerce to adopt the Department of Energy asset-based home energy score, giving cities the authority to administer and promote the home energy score program. The Department of Licensing would develop procedures for attaining a home energy assessor license. We have more transparency on the greenhouse gas emissions and energy usage when we buy a car than we do on our homes. And it simply makes sense to me that we would have that transparency and ability to know what our operating costs are when we buy a home. So the data assessor would provide a current home energy score on a relative scale of between one to 10, 10 being the best, and the amount of energy use per year by fuel type. The annual cost of energy in dollars by fuel type and total cost, recommendations for improving home energy savings, and home improvement recommendations that may include but are not limited to windows, walls, roofs, attics, and floor insulation. Um, an, itemized, an, an itemized estimated energy savings in dollars per year after itemized recommended priority improvements are completed. So it gives them kind of a roadmap when, when you buy a home for how you could improve your energy score. And I would just add that um, this is entirely, um, it, it's by choice, no one has to do it. And um, the, the realtors are neutral. We discussed the bill and I took some of their amendments and um, cities such as Olympia are waiting for this program. They'd really like to implement it. So I appreciate you hearing the bill. Thank you very much and open to questions if you have any. Yes, so I mean, a lot of uh, what we hear around uh, the cost of homeownership is that anything that we add on is is pricing out one more group of people. Um, can you maybe speak to that point um, with this particular measure? Do you think that it's going to have a negative impact on home prices? Well, so I think it's implemented in Portland and Oregon. And what I've heard is the price is paid for by the seller and it would be between uh, two and $400. I'm, I'm not sure that we know exactly where it'll land, but I think that's relatively small when you consider the possible savings um, that consumers when they buy a home could could reap. And, and in terms of workforce to be able to perform these audits, um, are there a lot of people who do this, this work? So I think um, there are people who do this work. Some utilities offer something similar, but not entirely. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why there would be a, a home energy assessor uh, license that people would have to go through so that you know you're not getting scammed or um, there's no risk involved. Okay. Any other questions for our prime sponsor? All right. Thank you Super. so much for joining us. Thank With you that, I'm much. going to suspend the public hearing on House Bill 1433 and open the public hearing on House Bill 1392 uh, related to electronics repair. Good morning, members of the committee, Angela Kleist, committee staff. The bill before you is in gross second substitute 1392, promoting the fair servicing and repair of digital electronic equipment. The committee heard the companion bill sponsored by Senator Stanford. Under the bill before you, effective January 1, 2020, 
2024, an original manufacturer of digital electronic equipment and related parts manufactured for the first time and first sold or leased on or after July 1, 2023, must make available to any independent repair provider and owner on fair and reasonable terms, any parts, tools, and documentation required for the diagnosis, maintenance, or repair of such equipment and related parts. Digital electronic equipment means a desktop computer, laptop computer, tablet computer, cell phone, or smartphone containing a microprocessor and originally manufactured for distribution and sale in the US for general consumer purchase. Nothing in the bill shall be construed to require original manufacturers or an authorized repair provider to take specified actions, such as divulge a trade secret or license any divulge a trade secret or license any intellectual property. Original manufacturers and authorized repair providers shall not be liable for services performed by an independent repair provider. Violations of this act are enforceable under the CPA solely by the Attorney General. A fiscal note is available for the substitute house bill version a new one has been requested um, the amendments adopted in the house may not have significant impact to the costs so it indicates approximate impact of 1.8 million to the four-year outlook for enforcement purposes the differences between the version the senate bill that the committee heard and the bill before the committee is in gross second substitute house bill 1392 it specifies the provisions of the bill only apply to digital electronic equipment and parts that are manufactured for the first time um, and sold after or on July 1, 2023. So it's not, it not, doesn't go to apply to all. It does not include the requirement that a original manufacturer must make available for purchase to independent pro repair providers all parts, tools, or documentation that is made available to an authorized repair provider. It does require that the provision of privacy and security information to consumers before any type of repair of digital electronic equipment. And then in that statement, it specifies that violations of privacy may be referred to law enforcement for criminal prosecution and violators may be liable for damages, including mental pain and suffering that a violation of privacy may have caused to a consumer's business, person, or reputation. And the House bill version before the committee adds exemptions for manufacturers and distributors of medical devices, of certain medical devices, motor vehicles, related part, related equipments and dealers, any power generation or storage equipment or equipment for fueling or charging motor vehicles. And with that, I will conclude my remarks. Any questions for staff? All right, seeing none, welcome Rep Gregerson. Good morning. Um, for the record, my name is Mia Gregerson from the 33rd Legislative District, and I want to thank this committee for hearing this bill this morning and also for hearing um, Senator Stanford's bill earlier. Um, as you heard, there's only just a very a minor change, very important one, and that's just, again, doing a little bit more to educate consumers wherever they are throughout the state uh, to know what their rights are and to reference existing law. You know, this um, type of policy is actually not typically where you would see me <laughs> get involved in, but, it, you know, when the pandemic hit, we all went to work, and right away we knew that our students and our families, um, businesses, went were stuck at home to stay safe. And with that, the, the digital divide became front and center of everything that we needed to focus on. Um, and since then, as you know, the digital, the digital equity stool is fast, affordable internet, um, it is the device is necessary for the appropriate work that the person is trying to accomplish, and then the literacy skills. And so there is a glaring need when we had tens of thousands of devices sitting in warehouses that we couldn't get repaired and put into the hands of our students. Um, and um, fortunately, this topic had been deliberated on for years. It was very, very controversial. Um, I'm happy to say that every single word in this policy has been vetted heavily. <laughs> um, and I think you'll see from every part of the spectrum, I'm weighing in on this and supporting the language. Um, as you know, there are at least a dozen other states uh, contemplating right to repair legislation. Um, in this case, we're really staying the course to be targeted so that we can be the North Star on the appropriate policy necessary to do something as complicated as this, but that could be replicated in other states around the country. This is our service to the people of Washington state, but also to our country, to our other states. Now, this policy is also something that's already being done in other countries. We're not, we're not asking you to deliberate on something that's brand new. Um, 
And so when you're hearing concerns about legislation related to intellectual property, to trade secrets and, and sensitive data, that has been very well vetted. And you'll hear testimony today on both sides of that. I also want to pay recognition that there's a little bit of an attack on our small independent businesses and that if they get access to these tools and to the information that's necessary to serve our people of Washington state, that they'll, they'll take the data and they'll do something inappropriate with it. I just don't think that's the case. And in fact, since the, the hearing um, in the House, I've worked with the Washington Prosecutors Association and the AG's office to find out, is there a lineup of cases? Is there a back backlog of cases? Will this be a, a big deal? And neither one of them have been able to come forward with anything. So I urge you to please consider this policy today. It's good for the environment, right? It's good for business. Um, it's good for closing the digital divide. And uh, with that, I entertain any questions. Any questions for our prime sponsor? Senator Wellman. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Rep. Gregerson. Um, why are, why are um, medical devices or motor vehicles um, exempted from this? Yes, um, as you can imagine, the right to repair conversation is highly controversial. And so we have very well, um, we have very strong voices within the legislature to want to make sure that this is a very targeted policy. It only deals with electronic devices. That doesn't mean that farm equipment, medical devices, wheelchairs, and other things are being deliberated on in other states is not something in our future. But today, this is about electronic devices. Okay. Senator Lovick. Yeah, no, you, I'll go back. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Rep. Gregerson. It's good to see you. I was going to can I ask the same question that uh, Senator Wellman asked? Can you give me just a brief example of some of the medical devices that you're accepting? Well, again, this bill has nothing to do with medical devices, but my assumption is when I think about other states that are talking about medical devices during the pandemic, we had a lot of ventilators that were in use and there was a challenge to make sure that there was appropriate equipment, tools, and access to the, to the documentation in order to keep them repaired and working. Uh, Senator Wellman. No, I, I'm, I'm just looking at the title of the bill, which talks about digital electronic equipment. Um, so I uh, actually, you know, with 1500 chips in a car and telematics being a major industry, um, it's interesting that it, those have been um, exempted. The other thing, uh, may I ask one more question? Briefly. <laughs> uh, then, no, then I won't ask it. Thank you. That's all right. It's not a brief question. All right, thank you. Uh, so seeing no other questions for our prime sponsor, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm going to suspend the public hearing on House Bill 1392 and open the public hearing on House Bill 1789 related to ecosystem services. Good morning, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee for the record, Kim Cushing, staff to the committee, and Growth Substitute House Bill 1789 is an act relating to expanding revenue generation and economic opportunities from natural climate solutions and ecosystem services. This bill is similar to Senate Bill 5688, but is not a true companion. Um, the, the committee did hear it and, and, and moved it to ways and means. Um, under current Washington law, ecosystem services are defined as the benefits that the public enjoys as a result of natural processes and biological diversity. Under the bill before you, it authorizes DNR to enter into contracts for ecosystem service projects on public lands, consistent with terms and conditions acceptable to DNR after the Board of Natural Resources approval, only for the purpose of generating additional revenue but by, by providing ecosystem services. It requires any ecosystem service project on public lands to be limited to afforestation, reforestation, and aquatic products. It also requires them to be consistent with ongoing forest, forest health planning efforts and investments, results in an increase in revenue to beneficiaries as compared to expected revenue that may be that may exist in absence of the ecosystem service project and not limit or impair the exercise of tribal treaty and reserved rights. It conditions DNR, DNR's authority to enter into a contract that results in payment on a project being consistent with DNR's management of the underlying public land for agriculture or com commercial timber harvest and to ensure that DNR meets its fiduciary responsibility to the state's trust beneficiaries. 
DNR may directly offer ecosystem service credits for sale with established compliance or verifiable and established voluntary ecosystem service marketplaces, and it may enter into contracts with project developers or brokers through public auction or by direct negotiation. Contracts for ES projects may last up to 125 years, and the proceeds from the contracts must be deposited into appropriate account in the state treasury and distributed in the same manner as money derived from the sale of valuable materials. It requires DNR to report the term of contract and projected revenues to the board, and it directs DNR to submit a report to the legislature and OFM by December 1st of 2024 that includes information on the payment of ES projects entered into or committed to by DNR and, and, and any challenges or barriers encountered in the process of attempting to implement carbon offset or payments for ES projects. Um, there is a fiscal note. It's non-zero, but indeterminate cost and or savings. I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions for staff? All right, Representative Reeves, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Christine Reeves. I have the honor and the privilege of serving as the state representative from the 30th Legislative District, South King County Federal Way. So you can probably imagine why would a suburban mom be interested in ecosystem services and carbon credit sales? Well, I can tell you as a suburban mom that one of the things I know as a legislator in this building is that our schools are our paramount duty. And one of the prime beneficiaries of uh, the work that the Department of Natural Resources does is to generate revenue for our beneficiaries, for our schools, for our universities, for our counties. So as a mom who cares about public education, who wants to make sure that every single kid in this state gets access to high quality, equitable education, we know that we need to be investing more dollars to make that happen, whether it's in our special education services, whether it's in nursing or counseling, we've got to have the revenue to do that. I represent the sixth most diverse school district in the country, not just the state of Washington, in the country. I want to make sure that those kids have access to educational opportunity. And one of the best ways to do that is to get them the resources necessary to make sure that their schools are equitable. But what I'll tell you, uh, Madam Chair, is that this is not my portfolio of expertise, right? In no way, shape, or form am I an expert on ecosystem services. But I think that this bill does three very specific things. One, I think it does do the work of making sure that we are generating revenue for our schools, our beneficiaries, to ensure that we can be moving forward um, and supporting them. Two, I think it does uh, something really innovative, quite frankly, in state government by creating an access opportunity and authorizing environment for the Department of Natural Resources to compete in the open market to, to utilize the resources that our states have entrusted with them to sell carbon credits and be able to generate that revenue. And then three, Madam Speaker, or well, we'll go with Madam Speaker, sorry. Um, we have a Madam Speaker on our side. Uh, I think the third thing that it does most importantly and maybe is not as obvious in the language of this legislation is it attempts to thread the needle on the and both. The and both of correcting historic and economic harms done to communities who have felt the impact of environmental work that has put families out of business, has created uh, long-term um, unsustainable uh, economic disparity in their communities. But it does the both of making sure that we can work to correct those historic harms while building trust, quite frankly, in our government, in our system, to do the and both of, of correcting those harms while looking to the future and looking to the future that ensures that timber continues to be a critical part of those communities, that the environment and the protection of it matters, and that we are doing the and both of, of creating economic opportunity while protecting our environment and creating environmental justice for all of our communities. And so, Madam uh, Chair, I commend this bill to you for your consideration. I would just add, it has been a very well-worked bill on our side of uh, the chamber, and would just ask that as folks think about tweaking this bill, that please be considerate that you may tip the apple cart um, in trying to perfect this legislation. Um, and that will put uh, our state at a disadvantage, as you just saw in the recent carbon credit auction. We're missing an opportunity if we don't move this legislation forward this year to make sure that DNR has access to do that work. So commend the bill to you. Happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I know there are folks signed in way more qualified than I am to speak on the technicalities of this legislation. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, any questions for our prime sponsor? 
All right, seeing none, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to uh, suspend the public hearing on 1789 and open the public hearing on, or on House Bill 1391. And then right after that, we'll do 1390 and get uh, both of Rep. Rammel's bills read in. Good morning, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee, Greg Vogel, committee staff. The next bill is Second substitute House Bill 1391 relating to energy and buildings. For background, the Department of Commerce is charged with periodically reviewing the state energy strategy with the guidance of an advisory committee. 2019, the legislature directed Commerce to review the strategy to align with the requirements of the Energy Independence Act, the Clean Energy Transformation Act, and the state's greenhouse gas emission reduction limits. The updated strategy was published in 2021. Also, uh, Commerce in partnership with the Washington State University Energy Program also administers weatherization programs serving low and moderate income households. To summarize the bill, Commerce must establish a statewide building energy upgrade navigator program to help building owners access electrification and energy efficiency services and funding and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, create jobs and business opportunities and develop the building sector workforce. Commerce must coordinate and collaborate with the Washington State University Extension Energy Program and may consult with others on the design and implementation of the program. By March 1st, 2024, Commerce must contract with one or more administrators to run the program. The administrator may be an entity including a nonprofit organization or community organization, but may not be an energy utility. The administrator must provide outreach and deliver energy services to residential building owners and renters and owners of commercial buildings under 20,000 square feet. The administrator must develop a contractor network to assist with finding and accessing qualified energy contractors for customers. Every even numbered year on September 1st, Commerce must report on the implementation and performance metrics of the program. By December 1st, 2023, Commerce must convene a technical advisory group to provide ongoing guidance to the program consisting of members representing community labor environmental and business interests by december 1st of each year the technical advisory group must also provide a progress report of the program a fiscal note shows costs of around 3.5 million for the 23-25 biennium and 20 and 2.3 million for the 25-27 biennium i'd be happy to answer any questions a question from senator short thank you madam chair um greg is there anything in the bill that as these these navigators work um, with all kinds of, of different equipment and things to do energy efficiency projects, to, is it is it limiting or are, are there are there um, energy efficiency products or services that can't be provided or are discouraged under the bill? Uh, yes, the bill specifically excludes. Uh, energy upgrades uh, related to uh, fossil fuels or natural gas. Any other questions for staff? All right, Representative Rammel, welcome. Good morning, Senators. Uh, thanks so much for hearing this bill. Uh, for the record, my name is Alex Rammel, State Representative from the 40th District. Um, fossil fuel use in our buildings is going to be one of the biggest challenges we face as we work to address the climate crisis. Um, it is um, some of the most difficult uh, sectors to reach uh, systematically. The good news is that we have the tools, we've got the technology uh, available, and federal resources are on the way. We know how to um, we know how to implement things like heat pumps distributed um, energy systems like solar panels, good old fashioned insulation. The, uh, the federal government has recently made huge investments that will be flowing down the, the states through the Inflation Reduction Act. And then under the Climate Commitment Act, uh, Washington State will have resources that we can direct to fill in uh, some of those gaps in the coming years. And of course, our, our utilities are already um, implementing uh, much of this work and are good partners uh, throughout most of the state. These different programs, though, present a challenge. Uh, there was an article in the Bellingham Herald yesterday about heat pumps and weather and how they could work for different homeowners' buildings. And one of the HVAC installers in Bellingham had put together a flow chart that they showed in the article. It was two pages to find out if you qualify for a heat pump rebate through the, uh, the local utility. And that's one of these programs. That's a lot for folks to sort through when they're just trying to figure out how to replace their heating system or what they can do to reduce their energy bills. 
The purpose of this piece of legislation is to make that really easy. We need that service to help people identify the opportunities to figure out what makes uh, the most sense to do in their building. Is the, most, is the smartest way to save energy through windows upgrades or through HVAC improvements or insulation? And so having the experts and the tools and the resources to both guide uh, folks to the cost-effective improvements and also to the, um, to the various different programs that they may qualify for. Over time, this program will then have folks who are talking to people, um, small business owners, tenants, homeowners, and figuring out where are the gaps in our system, whether those are geographic, are there barriers uh, to workforce development, um, unique challenges uh, for tenant and landlord uh, situations where one party is paying for the upgrades and the other party is paying the energy bills. This uh, program will help us solve those problems and um, provide us feedback on a regular basis about the best use of the state's uh, resources through the Climate Commitment Act in the coming years. We're starting to see the resources that can uh, tackle this problem at the scale that it needs to be tackled. Uh, this bill will help us figure out how to do that as effectively and efficiently as possible um, and happy to uh, respond to any questions. Uh, Senator Short. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was looking at an article that talked about, you're definitely right, the Inflation Reduction Act has some amazing funding, you know, to help homeowners with energy efficiency. How, how do you marry your bill with their, you know, their program, which allows natural mm -hmm. gas, heat pumps, you know, water boilers, things like that? I mean, I, I don't, your bill's not a bad bill. I just think, wouldn't it wouldn't it be more advantageous not to limit it, depending on where these these navigators would be working in the state of Washington? Sure. Thank you for the question. Um, so, the program here is one about uh, providing building owners and tenants with advice about what's available, and we're talking about putting Washington State resources into making recommendations. It doesn't prevent anybody from taking that information and, um, and going and making whatever kinds of improvements they want in their building. But, we're, but from my perspective, it does not make sense for us to put public money into subsidizing uh, fossil fuel investments in buildings. And if I could make one correction to the, to the staff's response, there is a little bit of a nuance here. So our utility programs, for example, offer um, rebates for appliances but your gas company may also offer rebates uh, for insulation or air sealing or uh, thermal measures. So it would, uh, the program would direct customers towards the latter kinds of improvements. But when we're talking about putting in an appliance that's going to last for decades, those customers will be on the hook to pay not just the gas costs, which are rising more rapidly than it, but also the, um, the embodied costs uh, through the, um, the carbon allowances that the gas companies will ultimately be included under the CCA. So we'd be directing people to do something that the Climate Commitment Act is directing, is ultimately pointing them towards not doing. So it doesn't make sense to have two arrows going in opposite directions. Senator Short. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a follow up though, the Climate Commitment Act actually contains natural gas all throughout the bill. So it's not inconceivable that the Climate Commitment Act could be used. I mean, it's a consumer mm -hmm. choice, is it not? Um, it is. And again, this bill does allow that consumer choice. Um, it just does not use state resources to direct people to install gas appliances. Any other questions for our prime sponsor in this bill? All right, sit tight. Uh, we're gonna suspend the public hearing on uh, 1391 and open the public hearing on 1390. Uh, the bill before you second substitute House Bill 1390, an act relating to district energy systems. There is no Senate companion. For brief background in 2019, the legislature enacted the Clean Buildings Act, which required commerce to establish by rule a state energy performance standard. This standard seeks to maximize reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from the building sector and includes energy use intensity targets by building type. Turning to the bill before you, it defines a campus district energy system as a district energy system that provides heating 
heating, cooling, or heating and cooling to three or more buildings with more than 100,000 square feet of combined condition space where the system and all the connected buildings are owned by either a single entity, a public-private partnership where one public entity owns the buildings and a private entity owns the energy system, or two private entities and one owns the connected buildings and the other owns the energy system. It defines state campus district energy system as a campus district energy system with five or more buildings where the system and connected buildings are owned by the state of Washington or by a public private partnership, including um, one public buildings owner and one private entity. The bill requires the owner of the state campus district energy system to develop a decarbonization plan and requires the plan to provide a strategy for up to 15 years or longer if approved by Commerce, and it requires the owner to begin developing the plan by June 30th of 2024 and submit a final plan to Commerce one year later and submit a progress report on the implementation every five years. It directs Commerce to provide a summary report on decarbonization plans to the governor and the legislature by December of 2025. It requires the plan to contain certain elements, including mechanisms to replace fossil fuels in the heating plants. It encourages the owner of a state campus district energy system to include in a plan distribution network upgrades, on-site energy storage facilities, and incorporation of industrial symbi symbiosis projects. Um, finally, the bill creates an alternative compliance pathway to the state energy performance standard for the owner of a state campus district energy system if the owner of the system is implementing an improved decarbonization plan. And that plan, when fully implemented, meets the energy use intensity target established for the campus. If it meets uh, requirements for benchmarking energy management and the operations and maintenance planning requirements under the standard and submits a request to Commerce once every five years and Commerce approves it. And the bill does allow non-state owned campus district energy systems to opt into the process to achieve an alternative compliance pathway, provided the owner of the campus district energy system submits a request to commerce and that request is approved. There is a fiscal note um, under the operating expenses for the 23-25 biennium. It estimates a general fund state impact of 700,000. And for the capital budget for the 23-25 biennium estimates 8.7 million for state agencies and higher education institutions to hire project consultants to assess uh, existing campus district energy systems and complete pre-design effort to meet the new decarbonization plan requirements. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for staff? Seeing none, go ahead, Rep. Ramel. Great, uh, thank you again. Uh, I am still Alex Ramel from the 40th District. Um, so Washington State has uh, over a dozen of these district uh, energy systems with a central heating plant and multiple buildings around the campus that are part of the um, part of the building stock that this state owns and operates. So this campus, uh, the Capitol campus here, think about our uh, universities, correctional facilities, uh, those kinds of things. These are some of the biggest energy users uh, under Washington State's management. Um, so they're big, uh, big piece of this state's operating. Uh, um, carbon footprint. Uh, and in many cases, these are systems with a significant deferred, uh, deferred maintenance backlog. Upgrading these systems is uh, one of our biggest opportunities to reduce our carbon footprint while also reducing uh, our maintenance and operating costs. Um, this bill simply proposes that we should plan out uh, how we're going to upgrade those systems over time. Um, and as we're doing that, I think we'll realize some opportunities uh, to see some economies of scale and also to develop public-private partnerships, which will reduce the cost of uh, making uh, those system improvements. So planning is the first piece of the bill. Once those plans are in place, I think these uh, these uh, systems um, can provide us an alternate opportunity uh, to comply with the building performance standards uh, that we've put in place. Um, at, because the central heating systems operate a little bit differently than if we had a boiler in the basement of this building, uh, we should treat those systems um, comprehensively under the building uh, performance uh, requirements that we have in place. And uh, again, this will allow us to be able to do that uh, and to meet those standards more cost effectively. 
I will say that this uh, bill was initially intended uh, to focus only on uh, state-owned um, district energy systems like this. We heard uh, on the House side, uh, we heard about how there are some uh, private systems, again, with a central heating system and a small campus uh, that are interested in participating. We did open it up, again, where that central heating system is owned by the same entity that's uh, that's operating that campus. Um, the chair and I have had a couple of conversations about um, about thermal energy utilities, where a central heating plant sells heat uh, or steam to numerous customers. Um, I do think we need a, um, a approach to that, but this bill is not the right vehicle for addressing that. And so I'm not recommending uh, any further changes uh, in that direction. So finally, I'll just say this is um, an important uh, part of the way that we can recognize uh, the importance of um, a variety of skilled trades in implementing our clean energy economy. Folks putting in these pipe, uh, these pipe systems um, have an important role to play, um, and this bill recognizes that. Um, with that, happy to try to answer any of your questions. Any questions? Uh Okay. Our chair. <laughs> yeah, no, I just want to say thank you so much for coming. And I think this is an important piece of work. Uh, when we went to Denmark, we saw a number of these facilities being employed uh, in a very thoughtful and I think strategic way in order, in order for us to decarbonize as well. So I just want to say thank you for that partnership and the continued conversation as well. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. you so much for joining us. Oh, if, if I may, one, uh, I just heard from uh, one of the experts I had asked to come speak on this bill. If you've got flexibility to complete the hearing on this bill, I would count it a favor. Thank you. Complete the hearing on this bill right now, you mean? If, if you can do that first. Oh, no, no. Okay, we're going to start running back through the agenda. Sorry. Okay. okay. Thanks. Yeah. All right, so with that, we're going to suspend the public hearing on this measure and reopen the public hearing on 1392, uh, right to repair. Uh, we're only going to have one minute for testifiers, and when that light goes red, we're going to we're going to cut it off because it's uh, we have about 80 people signed up to testify for the number of measures that we have on the agenda. Uh, so with that, we're going to pull up our first panel, uh, which is Mitch Kramer, uh, Lodrina Shern, and Nathan Proctor. They are all remote. Uh, next on deck will be Melissa Gomboski, Ashley Sutton, and Clayton Peterson. Uh, sorry, staff, to pinch hit uh, remote panel quickly there. <laughs> Uh, for our Zoom audience, please make sure to have yourself in gallery view so that you can see the timer. They will feel the timer. <laughs> Mitch Kramer, Lodrina Sharon, and Nathan Proctor. Well, I see you two here, so let's go ahead and begin with you. All right, Melissa? Yes, <clears throat> Chair Wynn, uh, Ranking Member McCune, Honorable Members of the Committee, I'm Melissa Gomboski, pleased to be here today on behalf of CTIA, the Wireless Communications Association. Unfortunately, in opposition to the bill before you, we have testified before. I'll just underscore two of our primary concerns. One is that it risks consumer privacy and safety. And second is the marketplace is expanding for repair options. We don't think this bill is needed as there are many growing options for repair. Uh, so first, just to uh, remind you of what the concern we raised before, the bill opens the door for bad actors to access sensitive information on private phones with just a simple password and unauthorized repair technician can access photos health data, banking data, biometric data, and anything on your phone. This bill would allow an untrained and unvetted technician to access private information that has legally been secure until now. Uh, we have submitted to you an academically driven study showing that unauthorized repair technicians too, ox too often access private data. Thank you. And it happens particularly in women's phones. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Wynn, members of the committee. My name is Nora Burns here on behalf of TechNet in uh, replacement of Ashley, also in respectful opposition to 1392. Um, just to add to what Melissa had said, the relationship between the authorized repair providers and manufacturers ensures that technicians receive the appropriate training and screening to be qualified to offer repairs. And these contractual relationships also ensure that the bad actors can be held accountable. And considering the sensitive personal data that is stored on our devices, this can include debit and credit card information, medical information, 
information and intimate photos. And more information on that study, half of the logs recovered in local and regional repair shop study found that personal data was not only accessed, but copied to personal devices belonging to technicians. And none of the shop study had a privacy policy or customer data protection in place. And it's unclear how a consumer will be made whole if their data is breached in these cases. Unfortunately, 1392 severs that accountability link and instead requires manufacturers to provide these unvetted third parties documentation and tools that will create more opportunities for them to snoop on consumers. Thank you. Thank you. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. For either of you, is there a state that's figured out a way to address this issue that you're aware of that where we can protect that privacy, ensure that there's a way to, to, to do that? Thank you for your question, Senator. So while New York has passed a law, they have not gone far enough to protect the consumers. So there are still not enough privacy policies that are mandated on the independent repair folks to protect consumers. Thank you, Senator Trudeau. Thank you. Building off of that, it, it sounds a little bit to me like we could put standards in place for these repair shops, like privacy policies and otherwise. But my, my, my question is, for those, uh, let's say you go, go to Apple, right, to fix your iPhone, it sounds like there's training for those folks, but are there consequences? Is there any information about what happens in terms of a breach of data when that uh, situation occurs? Is there Certainly. Been a technician that's accessed information and had it be revealed? Thank you for your question, Senator. Yes. And so part of the private privacy policies and consumer protection policies that manufacturers like Apple and Best Buy, some of the larger uh, repair shops have in place, is an accountability link. So not only do they have to go through the training, but they will hold a bad actor accountable. And in addition to that, they're, for example, when you bring a phone in, they're going to require you not ask for passwords or passcodes and that the device be wiped. And that's not a requirement that's mandated on independent repair shops, but these are policies that are baked in to the large manufacturers that have these types of training and offer those types of services. Senator Wellman. Just quickly, do you know, uh, is there anything that forbids anybody from another country from um, having access to these this equipment and um, the tools and the parts? So uh, is there a way of restricting this just to the United States or can somebody come in and become a, a conduit of uh, data and or of equipment, et cetera? Um, in other countries. I don't think this bill addresses that, and I'm not sure how we would prevent other countries from accessing these. Thank you, Senator. Senator Trudeau, to your question about whether or not there can be um, safety measures put in place, what can be done is any of our small businesses in Washington state can become an authorized repair person through our manufacturers. It's a uh, free and inexpensive. It does take some time and vetting to protect consumer privacy, but we do think that that's worth it. All right. Thank you so much to this panel. Uh, next, we have uh, Ladrina and Nathan. I see are here. One final call out for Mitch and Clayton. Uh, and with that, uh, Ladrina, go ahead. Thank you, Chair and Committee members, for granting me time to speak in support of HB 1392. My name is Lodrina Cherney. I'm a cybersecurity and digital forensics expert based in Boston, and I teach to law enforcement agents all around the world skills that help bring criminal hackers to justice and help return missing children to their families. The work that I do interfacing with computer hardware and having tools to remove hard drives from a computer or replace a screen are things I routinely do as part of my investigations. And the ability to repair digital electronic equipment is something that helps me fight crime, and having these tools and documentation helps increase safety. And by the way, I know of no proven risk to safety when these tools are available. The digital safeguards written into HB 1392 Section 4 support best practices for keeping digital data safe and are the same recommendations I would share with a friend or family member. Thank you for allowing me to speak in support of 1392. Thank you so much. Mitch. You're, you're on mute though. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Chair, members of the committee for taking the time to meet with us today. My name is Mitch Kramer and I started FixGo Computer and Phone Repair in Bellingham over a decade ago. People in my community break their expensive devices and they absolutely depend on. They bring it into me and I either fix it or I can't. The main reasons I can are lack of parts. The device design prevents me from repairing it as is the case with Apple laptops for the last few years or the manufacturer has used software locks to disable features because of aftermarket parts. This is a very rewarding job. Most people who walk in my door are in crisis mode. 
A mom with a broken phone can't get in touch with her kids and vice versa, and a small business owner can't operate and communicate with clients. The examples are endless. Um, we hear the opposition talk about data that can be stolen by independent shops. Although there is no evidence to this issue, Samsung has come up with a great idea that Apple could implement if they are genuine, genuinely concerned. Uh, here's a quote from Samsung's website. Maintenance mode will hide your personal data and other information, such as photos, videos, contacts, and messages, if you need to send it in for repair. Um, my community needs lawmakers like you to stand up for small businesses like mine and to not listen to the fear mongering from the industry opposition. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair members. My name is Nathan Proctor. I'm a Senior Right to Repair Campaign Director with the PERG Network, which includes WashPERG here in support. Uh, we have a massive stuff problem. We have we produce way more than we need, and way more than the world can sustain, and so much of it is essentially disposable. <laughs> that needs to stop. Manufacturers control repair, and they do so to control the cost and to decide when people can't fix and have to replace. And as a result, people are pretty upset about how much waste we generate and how hard manufacturers make repaired. And I think we passed the point where this is a question of if right to repair becomes law or the standard, but how. And Washington's been a leader. The legislation before you is one of the most carefully crafted with input from many stakeholders. I think Washington deserves a spot at the table. I want the terrific leadership of people like Mia Gregerson and Derek Stanford to be reflected in how right to repair gets implemented. So please help us move forward here. The planet needs us to fix more, toss Thank less, you. and your colleagues' leadership on these issues deserves to be allowed to continue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. Our next panel is going to be Caleb Williamson, Patrick Hedger, Edward Long, and Charlie Brown. Uh, I think that it, who is that in remote? Is that Patrick? Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, distinguished members of the community. My name is Patrick Hedger. I'm executive director of the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, a nationwide nonprofit, nonpartisan taxpayer and consumer advocacy organization. Our organization respectfully opposes HB 1392, the Digital Fair Repair Act, on the grounds that it will have unintended yet adverse economic and security consequences for consumers. The bill requires device manufacturers to create new lines of business or expand existing ones to provide equipment and services to an untold number of independent repair businesses, yet prohibit its manufacturers from profiting from these mandated business lines. These additional costs will undoubtedly be reflected in higher prices and lower quality of devices, so it's sort of a hidden tax from the manufacturer. Above all, the bill's sweeping mandates will make devices less secure at a time when device security should be increasing as their functions grow. Increasingly, smartphones function as consumers' wallets and keychains all in one, uh, granting access to credit cards and bank accounts and automobiles. Security implications of mandated device access to any and all independent repair providers is obvious, which is why so many categories of products are carved out from this bill. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, Edward, I see you're here. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Dr. Edward Long, and I'm director of the Centre for Tech and Innovation at the James Madison Institute. While right to repair proposals are seen by many as empowering consumers against large device manufacturers, it actually compromises critical cybersecurity protections that keep Washingtonians safe. Today, Almost every Washingtonian will have stored on their devices sensitive personal and financial information like credit cards, birth dates, photos of driver's licenses, or even social security numbers. These critical pieces of information could easily fall into the wrong hands if device manufacturers, manufacturers are required by law to provide, quote, tools and documentation needed to access and reset the lock function, end quote, on people's devices to any repair shop or anyone posing as a repair repair shop. Simply put, the risks of right to repair proposals are too great. I would urge you to fully consider the cybersecurity implications of these proposals and vote in a manner that keeps Washingtonians' data and personal information safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caleb. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Caleb Williamson, and I am the State Public Policy Council for ACT, the App Association. Uh, we are a global trade association representing small and mid-sized tech companies in the global app economy. Uh, we are testifying in opposition to HB 1392 because we feel that it poses unintended harms to businesses developing software compatible with mobile devices. Uh, the majority of small and medium-sized companies in the app economy create software and build apps that turn an ordinary device into a smart device. And most oftentimes you think of it as a phone. Um, and so, you know, the success of 
the business is building these softwares defend, depends greatly on the full functionality of the hosting device. And in most instances, like again, it'll be a phone or tablet. Um, if a key feature of a hosting device malfunctions due to a third party re- faulty third party repair, the software can become unable to interoperate effectively and putting some of our members' businesses at risk. For these reasons and those submitted in our written testimony, we oppose HB 1392. Thank you. Thank you so much. So before Charlie begins, I'll call up our next panel, which is Heather Lindberg, Patrick Connor, and Ashima Sukdev. Uh, Charlie, please go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Chair, um, members of the committee. I am Charlie Brown. I'm here today on behalf of the Consumer Technology Association. Consumer Technology Association is opposed to House Bill 1392. We have worked on this issue on a nationwide basis. In fact, we were engaged in the conversations out in New York uh, when that bill passed. After that bill passed and uh, went into law, uh, we approached the uh, proponents of this legislation and asked that we use the New York law as a model uh, legislation uh, to move forward across this nation because obviously you want to have one single uh, piece of uh, uh, policy like this. The proponents absolutely rejected our efforts and said, we're going to go at it essentially on a state-by-state basis. We disagree with that policy. We think there should be one nationwide policy. We're willing to work with the proponents, but the proponents do not seem to be uh, willing to work with us. And so we would ask you to reject this legislation, see if we can't come to a nationwide agreement on this issue. Thank you. Please go ahead. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Patrick Connor with NFIB, representing Washington's small business owners. <clears throat> You're getting bad information from a number of sources in this hearing. Small independent repair shops have been doing these same kinds of repairs for almost every other single uh, original equipment manufacturer in the country, in the world. There's one large dominant company who has a strict regime that prevents small independent repair shops from being able to work on their devices. So at its core, this bill is more about competition, freer markets, and fairness than it is anything else. This would level the playing field, allowing your small independent shops the ability to purchase at fair market value the tools and parts and instructions needed to make sure that your iPhone continues to function when you crack a screen, when you break the case, uh, or you have a a USB connection that's corroded. Simply that. I'd be happy to answer further questions if you want to talk about the details of warranties, trade secrets, uh, or how our store somehow would make you more vulnerable. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. All right. On deck, we have Ashima. Good morning, Chair Wynn and members of the committee. My name is Ashima Sukhdev, testifying in favor of 1392 on behalf of Seattle Public Utilities. The bill before you includes significant protections for consumers of electronic products. You all know that products like laptops, smartphones, and tablets have become increasingly necessary to succeed in our schools and economy. Making these products easier to repair and therefore more affordable will help improve access to electronics and assure consumers that the devices they invest in will last. The bill will also allow small electronics repair businesses to operate fairly while still allowing for manufacturers to have their own repair stores. This gives consumers options about where and how to repair their devices. Finally, improving the repairability of products will help keep these devices out of landfills and in use for longer. The greenhouse gas emissions associated with the manufacturing of new electronic products can also therefore be reduced. I urge your support. Thank you. Thank you, and Heather. Good morning, members of the committee. My name is Heather Lindberg and I'm representing Washington State PTA, the state's largest child advocacy organization. We strongly support substitute House Bill 1392 as it is one way to increase educational equity by closing the digital divide. Access to affordable and reliable digital devices is essential to overcoming the digital divide and this bill is a step towards that goal. It will shorten repair times, lengthen the useful lives of equipment, and decrease costs to school districts. This bill will positively impact the cost and on-hand availability of parts, particularly in smaller districts that cannot meet minimum purchase amounts and other requirements to become authorized service providers. Sending away broken devices for repair harm students that need the most, such as education students who rely on devices to communicate. Passing this money bill will save money, decrease time, devices are out of hands of children, 
and help close the digital divide. Here in Vancouver Public Schools, it has saved hundreds of thousands of dollars thank, each year. Thank you so much for joining us today. All right, uh, next we have Heather Trim, uh, Billy Rios, and Amy Boss. Welcome, Heather, and go ahead as we promote our remote testifiers. And then our final panel, just for the benefit of our Zoom audience, is going to be Stephen Ryan, uh, Kathy Sakahara, Travis Dutton, and Laurel Lehman. Good morning, uh, Chair, Vice Chair, and Ranking Member. I'm Heather Trim with Zero Waste Washington. When I go around and give talks about zero waste, people say, what, is, what can I do to deal with zero waste? And I tell them, the number one thing you can do is to hold on to things that you have get more life out of them, try to extend that, and then eventually recycle it or reuse it or give it to someone else. That This is at its heart a zero waste bill and very important. Um, E-waste generation has increased from by 60% from 2010 to 2019. We don't have stats beyond that. It is the second largest growing load of um, waste that's being generated in the United States right now. If we can keep these devices working longer for you, the consumers, and then to give it away to someone eventually to be repaired and reused in the schools and other places. Um, this will be something that is really, really good for zero waste. Um, we all have closets full of devices that need to be repaired. It's just a screen, a fan, something simple, and we need to get them repaired. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, for our Zoom testifiers, who do we have? Do we have Billy? <laughs> all right, there we go. Billy, please proceed. You're on mute though. Thank you. All right, there we go. Uh, I'm Billy Rios. Uh, I'm in support of HB 1392. I'm, I'm actually a white hat hacker. I prefer the term security researcher. Uh, I've worked in cybersecurity all my life. Uh, I've worked at Microsoft, at Google, in cybersecurity roles. I've had a cybersecurity company that was acquired, uh, and I now run a, a cybersecurity company that's focused on devices. We primarily work for the Department of Defense to carry things like jet fighters. Um, I've done a lot of medical device research. Uh, I was uh, instrumental in the research that led to two FDA cybersecurity recalls. There's only been four. Uh, I work with a lot of government agencies on critical infrastructure security. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to this bill, uh, but I'd like to speak to the cybersecurity aspect of it. Um, I can tell you as someone who researches vulnerabilities and rights exploits for a living, that this bill does not weaken the cybersecurity of devices. So a lot of the software that we use every day, some of the most innovative software cybersecurity engineering that we've seen uh, come from software that already provides this documentation to anyone that wants it. So uh, I don't know why folks keep referencing how this bill uh, diminishes cybersecurity for devices, but as uh, someone who does that for a living, I can tell you that's not the case. So. Thank you so much. Cindy, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Cindy McMullen. I'm an elected school board member in Central Valley, uh, which is in Spokane County. We have 14,000 students and approximately 1,200 staff members. We are proud to say that we are a one-to-one -one district, meaning that all of our students and staff have devices provided by the school district. Um, when one of those um, devices goes down, it has to be turned into the central office and shipped off to the manufacturer. A loaner is given to the user, but that loaner doesn't have all of the same um, setups that the user would have on their regular um, computer. That means that there's an interruption in learning and teaching. We only have 180 days to work with our students each year. Any interruption is a major interruption in student learning. We ask that you uh, please pass 1392 to allow education to continue for our kids. Thank you so much, Amy. Yes, good morning, members of the committee. My name is Amy Boss, and I'm the Director of Federal and State Affairs at NetChoice. NetChoice is a right of center trade association dedicated to free enterprise and free expression. We respectfully ask the committee to oppose HB 1392. We believe this mandate, uh, this bill would mandate manufacturers of cell phones, laptops, tablets, and other electronic products to provide owners and independent repair businesses with access to certain parts and tools. We are concerned that giving repair information to third parties, regardless of whether they've been trained, certified, or vetted, could create data security and safety risks for consumers. 
It may also place sensitive information in the hands of malicious hackers. In an era of sophisticated cyber attacks and unprecedented data leaks, state government should not be making it easier for criminals to access personal data. Beyond these concerns, we are uh, we are also concerned that this could affect intellectual property rights. A significant amount of research and development spending goes into the development. And thank, we, you, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Kathy, please proceed. You're on mute. Oh, it looks like she's off mute, but maybe having a technical difficulty. Can't hear you yet. Oh, you're almost coming through there. Uh oh. Oh, I'm there so you go. Sorry. Okay. Oh, please I, proceed. And if it if it's garbled, then sometimes you have to turn your camera off. But please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Senator uh, Lovelet, members of the committee. My name is Kathy Sakahara. I'm the Legislative Director for the Northwest Progressive Institute, and happy to say today that uh, the NPI supports this legislation for many of the reasons you already heard about. Um, it's good for business, consumers, and the environment. It's also strongly reported, uh, supported by voters. I'm pleased to share some new research we recently commissioned regarding <clears throat> Washington views, Washingtonians' views on the need uh, for the right to repair. In a survey conducted earlier this month, we found that 69% of uh, voters agreed that restricting access to parts and information is a problem, uh, with 45% strongly agreeing. Um, this support, only 15% disagreed. This support was true across the ideological spectrum. Um, and that 69% actually perfectly matches uh, support from a, a uh, research we did a year ago, which we shared with you thank, earlier. Thank, you so, thank you so much. Yes, please be sure to send us those comments in writing. Laurel, go ahead. Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee, my name is Laurel Lehman. I'm a policy analyst here representing Consumer Reports, testifying in support of the Digital Fair Repair Act. CR is a longtime champion of the right to repair. The bill before you today will give consumers more choices when it comes to repair in a world where it's become increasingly difficult for consumers to repair their electronic devices. According to our November 2021 National Representative Survey of more than 2,000 U.S. adults, one quarter of people who had broken a phone in the past five years set out to repair it initially, but ended up replacing it, many setting with many setting costs or inconvenience. Convenience. In that same survey, 84% uh, said that they agree with a policy that would require manufacturers to make repair of information and parts available, either to independent repair professionals or product owners. The bill gives consumers that choice, and um, it gives them more controls of the product that they own. It makes it more affordable to fix those products by increasing competition amongst repair businesses. It helps the environment by reducing e-waste and allowing us to hold onto our devices longer. Um, it is overwhelmingly supported by consumers um, across the spectrum, and we urge the same for you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And if there's a job available for an auctioneer, I nominate you. <laughs> All right, Travis, go ahead. Uh, good morning, Chair Wynn, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Travis Dutton, representing Washington State counties and uh, county solid waste managers, uh, testifying in support of 1392, expanding access to affordable repair that extends the life of electronic, of electronic devices would mean fewer discarded devices requiring costly special handling at transfer stations. This reduces unnecessary and potentially toxic waste, as well as labor, storage, and other costs for solid waste programs. Our county solid waste professionals are great for this and other efforts to reduce waste. Thank you. Thank you. And I understand Stephen is here with us now. Uh, hi there. Um, I'm Stephen Ryan. I'm the owner of a small independent electronics repair shop in Vancouver, Washington. This is some of my lab equipment for doing diagnostics and repairs on electronics. Uh, as a strong advocate for right to repair, I am here to support uh, HB 1392. This is critical leg legislation seeks to help level the playing field for independent repair shops like mine. Currently, we're forced to turn away numerous devices because we lack essential repair documentation, such as schematics, firmware, parts availability on reasonable terms. Without schematics and other information, diagnostics times becomes prohibitively long and costly to the customer, uh, making what would be simple re economically via uh, simple repairs economically unviable. Most manufacturers have the right, have tight control over repair processes by restricting access to parts or instructing the manufacturers of those parts not to sell to anyone other than themselves, making it nearly impossible for independent repair shops and device owners Eight. to obtain 
parts and repair devices. Thank you so much. You'll have to submit the rest of your comments in writing. I know a minute goes really fast. Thank you for joining us. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to close the public hearing on House Bill 1392 and open the public hearing on House Bill 1175 related to petroleum storage tanks since our prime sponsor is here to testify. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee, Greg Vogel, committee staff. The next bill is in Gross Substitute House Bill 1175 relating to creating a state financial assurance program for petroleum underground storage tanks. For background, the Pollution Liability Insurance Agency, or PLEA, provides reinsurance to private insurance companies that provide insurance coverage to owners and operators of petroleum underground storage tanks to meet federal and state financial responsibility requirements. A tax of 0.15% of the wholesale value of refined petroleum products, known as the Petroleum Products Tax, is levied upon the first possession in Washington of petroleum products. Proceeds from the tax are used to fund PLEA's reinsurance program. To summarize the bill, PLEA must establish and administer a state financial assurance program for owners and operators of petroleum underground storage tanks. Under the program, PLEA may provide an eligible owner or operator of a registered petroleum underground storage tank the following financial assurances. For releases occurring after tank registration, up to two million per occurrence for taking remedial action or for compensating third parties for bodily injury and property damage, and for releases occurring prior to tank registration, up to one million per occurrence for taking remedial action. PLEA may not spend more than three million per fiscal year for multiple occurrences involving a single storage tank. PLEA must establish by rule a fee to recover the cost of administering the program, not to exceed 25,000 per tank per year. PLEA may conduct remedial actions to investigate or clean up a release from a tank, including when a tank is not registered under the program. If the owner or operator consents and the release poses a risk to drinking water or remedial action is necessary to protect overburdened communities. The rate of the petroleum products tax is increased from 0.15% to 0.3%. The tax temporarily ceases to be imposed when the PLEA trust account balance exceeds $30 million in the previous calendar quarter and is reimposed when the balance falls below 15 million in the previous calendar quarter. The program expires July 1st, 2030. Fiscal note shows estimated expenditure costs of around 17 million for the four year outlook and estimated cash receipts of around 75.5 million and also indeterminate receipts expected from program fees. I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions for staff. And then Greg, just want just to clarify. So the revenue associated with this fund is from the petroleum companies themselves, right? It's not from the general fund. It's not from anywhere else. Uh, yes, it's it's from the tax on the petroleum products, Perfect. and then potentially the fees on the the tank owners for the program. And then I think part of it as well is if not for this program, I, I guess I'm sure you can answer that question. Are there other mechanisms beyond this program to help clean up storage tanks? Uh, so currently, uh, PLEA operates a reinsurance program for, for these storage tank owners. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? All right. Representative Dolio, welcome. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Wynn, Ranking Member Lovelet, uh, Ranking Member McEwen, Vice Chair uh, Lovelet. Um, you know, I, 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 um, we, we have a lot of underground storage tanks. Some of them link. Uh, the state has stepped up to help make sure to keep our um, uh, our environment clean by by creating a, re, a an assurance program in addition to what we already have. So one of the other answers to your question, uh, Chair Wynn, is that actually Maca does a ton of underground storage cleanups as well. Um, so these two programs work with each other. They are both funded by the producers um, and uh, very important. The, this bill basically provides additional resources to make sure we're cleaning these underground storage tanks up and more oversight um, for PLEA to make sure that they're done well. So this is a this is a good common sense bill um, and I would urge you to move it forward. I do want to uh, thank Senator Wellman for uh, uh, having the companion bill and working with me on this as well. I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have. Any questions for our prime sponsor? All right. See what that. one oh. quick stat <laughs> 4,134 underground storage stakes have been cleaned uh, up. So it, the, you know, we are making progress, but we have a lot more to do. So I hope you'll move this bill forward. 
Right. Thank you so much. So with that, I'm going to suspend the public hearing on House Bill 1175 and reopen the public hearing on House Bill 1789 related to ecosystem services. Our Commissioner of Public Lands, Hillary Franz, is here. Uh, so I'd like to welcome her up to speak to this DNR request legislation. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Wynn, Vice Chair Loveland, and members of the committee. And as you can see, I always bring back up whether I'm on fire or in fire or whether I'm in front of the legislature. So appreciate this. Um, I'm so glad to be in this committee again to testify in support of my agency request legislation, ESHB 1789. ESHB 1789 was passed out of the House with bipartisan support because there's a recognition that the Department of Natural Resources should be allowed to tap into new revenue streams, which increase funding for our schools, our communities, and other beneficiaries that strengthens and expands our state's working forests, our aquatic lands, and helps us take action on climate change. Our agency knows firsthand the impacts of climate change. We are on the front lines of it every single day, whether it's increasing wildfires, dying forest, dust storms and drought impacting our million acres of agriculture land, or sea level rise and ocean acidification impacting our aquatic lands. In 2021, the legislature stepped up to respond to this crisis with the Climate Commitment Act. It made our state a leader in the fight against climate change and created demand for local carbon offset projects that benefit our environment and our communities. And we are truly grateful. But there's just one problem. DNR is limited in our ability to use one of the best tools available to achieve the goals of the CCA, selling carbon credits. We can sell timber, we can sell wheat, we can sell hops, we can sell apples, we can sell shellfish and gooey ducks and marijuana, but we cannot sell carbon. Unlike the private sector, unlike local governments and unlike nonprofits. The bottom line, that means one, less revenue for our state, less revenue for our communities and our schools, and two, less ability for our agency to reduce our state's carbon emissions. DNR should be able to work in the carbon offset sector in the same way that the private sector, local governments, and nonprofits do. And the good news is we can fix it with ESHB 1789. This legislation will help us increase support for kids in school, generate more revenue for counties, libraries, fire districts, restore salmon habitat, protect forests, and get one step closer to accomplishing what the CCA envisions. Tapping into these new markets will generate additional funding from the private sector for critical natural resource investments that would otherwise require direct funding from the legislature. As an example, we have 138,000 acres that have burned in the last decade. Only 20% of that land has been reforested. Carbon projects can fund the cost of post wildfire reforestation efforts, leading to quicker and more robust reestablishment for us. And what that means is it also means more money, more money for our beneficiaries annually as those trees grow and sequester carbon. It means also that when the timber is harvested, those beneficiaries will earn more revenue. And then the process starts all over again, continually earning money for our schools, our communities and counties, all while sequestering carbon and providing critical fish and wildlife habitat and clean air and water. It also means that we can use carbon projects to create new high value forest lands through afforestation. And we know blue carbon projects that conserve and restore aquatic ecosystems can generate $35 or more per credit. Giving DNR direct access to these emerging markets, which are estimated to generate billions of dollars across the world, would allow us to raise the revenue needed to increase the pace and scale of reforestation and salmon recovery that critically supports jobs, local economies, increases our forest lands, and gets us closer to our, our climate goal. That's why ESHB 1799 is so important. Revenue from selling carbon credits will support our lands and waters throughout the state. Now, let me close. This legislation is critical, as I've stated, but I'm going to be frank. Climate change is one of our biggest crises in this state, but it's not the only crisis. Every day we see the challenges our communities are facing, homelessness, mental health, the cost of rising health care, education. All of these crises are important. They are all urgent. When we can go to carbon markets to fund our much needed investments in our lands and waters, we then don't need to take critical, critical much needed funding that would otherwise go to urgent housing, education and mental health needs. Let us be part of the solution with you to reducing the costs on the state budget, to addressing climate change, 
to reducing our state's carbon emissions, to restoring our lands and waters, to creating a better future for all. This is good policy. This is good government. This is good leadership. I urge you to pass this critical legislation and I thank you for all your work to date on this. Thank you, any questions for our commissioner? Uh, Senator McEwen. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Commissioner, thank you and thanks for working with both chambers and both sides on this as uh, this moves forward. Um, question here that uh, occurred to me, if you sell the credits on a given timber lot, and that, that, that plot burns down, what happens with those credits and how is that rectified? Yeah, so specifically, first of all, leveraging all the resources you guys have given us in wildfire response, we will make sure it doesn't burn down. Thankfully, I'm part of that. That's part of my responsibility. But separate from that, we know that things happen. Um, and I have Chinka here, but largely what happens when you enter into these markets, there's actually an insurance pool that protects against those kinds of losses to prevent it. That's already been built in. We see that example in California and Oregon um, when areas have burned that were part of the carbon market, but the insurance pool that set aside will protect that loss and prevent it. I guess a follow-up question to that. So one of the criticisms that I've heard about this bill is that it's a little premature to obligate the revenues that will be generated by these credits to keeping our beneficiaries whole. Uh, what happens under normal circumstances if uh, you know DNR isn't able to sell enough timber or you know do enough agricultural lands in order to make sure that the beneficiaries get the, the proceeds that they need? I want to make sure I understand your question. I'm sorry. It could be that it's early in the morning. So. Yes. So, uh, I'll try to rephrase it. So some of these projects as the, the little trees are growing, et cetera, uh, they might not necessarily generate the amount of revenue that a mature forest would. And so the, there's concern out there that if, uh, you know, the legislature puts in statute that we are obligating the revenues from these projects uh, to future needs of beneficiaries, that we will be kind of hamstringing those carbon, the eff eff efficacy of those carbon projects. So, um, so specifically, I see this not doing that. Largely what it will happen is every single year, so if trees are planted, let's take a reforestation, right? We talked about 100,000 acres have burned that have not been reforested. We go in, we plant those trees, right? We then annually, the beneficiaries will get a check for every pound ounce of carbon that is hap happening on that land. And every year those trees get larger and larger, more carbon is stored. The annual check grows larger. Then at the point of harvest, right? Whether it's 65 years, 70 years, that carbon is stored in the work environment and the beneficiaries will get the payment for that timber harvest. And then every time we cut a tree, three trees are planted in its stead. That will then grow again, generating more revenue annually, but also the carbon value of it. And that will continue in that cycle, 50, 60, 70 years from now, again, harvested. All right, any other questions for Commissioner Franz? All right, thank you thank for you joining much. us. Uh, we will call up our, let's see, who should we do first here? We all go in order. We've got Eric Fitch, uh, Lauren Brainart, and Paul Jewell. Uh, next on deck, we'll have uh, Mitch Friedman, Rachel Baker, and Alice Harris. Alex Harris. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair Wynn, members of the committee. My name is Eric Fitch, Executive Director at the Washington Public Ports Association, here today sharing our organization's support for the bill before you and to thank you for your work on this important issue. As I shared with the committee in February, many ports in Washington are trust beneficiaries receiving revenue through DNR's management of forest lands. Those funds support the essential function of port districts and other junior taxing districts. Um, ports are focused on promoting economic success in the communities in which they operate, and we feel the amendments adopted in the House support that function. We are glad to support it, and we recommend it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Paul Jewell, in support of House Bill 1789, speaking on behalf of the members of the Washington State Association of Counties. Counties are the beneficiaries of over 600,000 acres of land that's managed by the DNR, and these lands generated about $68 million in revenue. Uh, for county services in 2021. We're very interested for obvious reasons in supporting programs that increase diversification and add revenue for beneficiaries. And this bill is designed as a value added program, not to supplant existing revenues. Uh, we support the broad ideas contained in this bill. We've worked hard with DNR and other stakeholders to make sure that it protects our interests and it keeps these working lands as working. Uh, because of those provisions, we're okay with the bill. We know that it's not everything for everybody, uh, but we think it's a good start and we encourage you to move it forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is Laurel with us? Or Lauren, sorry. 
Hi, yes, good morning. Um, I'm Lauren Brainart with Mino Carbon. Mino is building large scale carbon removal, removal facilities that utilize waste timber residuals to produce biochar and renewable electricity. We are here today to show our support for House Bill 1789. We would also like to see the production and use of biochar for soil amendments re added into the allowable project list in the bill. We are working hand in hand with DNR to procure in-wood slash piles from DNR managed timberlands as a renewable feedstock for our biochar production facility. Likewise, this bill gives DNR the opportunity to generate carbon credits from applying biochar on DNR managed agricultural lands, which supports carbon sequestration, regenerative agriculture, and generates revenue for trust beneficiaries and growers. We have supported this process from the beginning and want to make sure that this important carbon reduction strategy is added back into the bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And there is work forthcoming on that particular issue. All right. Thank you so much to this panel. Uh, next, we have uh, Mitch Friedman. Good morning, committee. Uh, my name is Mitch Friedman. I'm executive director of Conservation Northwest, speaking from Seattle, but we have a presence across the state and for more than 20 years, <clears throat> we've done collaborative conservation in about a dozen counties from Cowlitz to Colville. We believe that better forestry equals better forests and better communities. We supported this bill as introduced, but we oppose the present version. It authorizes too little and limits too much. Specifically, environmental service funding uh, will not be allowed for better forestry, namely longer rotations. We think the Board of Natural Resources is well suited to determine the best use of environmental service projects. We propose an amendment giving <clears throat> the Board of Natural Resources such authority without undue limitations. The result can be better forestry, more carbon stored, and more funding. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Good morning, members of the committee. My name is Rachel Baker, Forest Program Director at Washington Conservation Action, unfortunately testified con on ESHB 1789 in its current form. We'd support a bill that meaningfully taps into revenue and climate potential of ecosystem services projects, but the, this bill falls short in two significant ways. First is the requirement that projects increase revenue. No other activities on state lands are required to do so. And this is an unrealistic burden as market forces dictate the price of products and revenue on state lands has been decreasing over time. Second is a limited scope of authorized projects, which does not include those with the greatest revenue and carbon value, namely improved forest management, the natural climate solution with the greatest potential in our state. Among 136 forest carbon projects in California's program in the last 10 years, just nine are reforestation, which have generated zero credits. 126 are improved forest management, which have generated 99.7% of carbon credits. It's essential to add a path in the bill expanding project types through a public process of the Board of Natural Resources. We submitted reasonable language of effect. If it's not adopted to the bill, we urge the committee not to pass the bill. Thank you, and Alex. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Alexander Harris. I'm the Land and Water Policy Manager at the Bellingham-based nonprofit Resources. I'd like to testify in opposition to HB 1789. Just six weeks ago, we testified in support of the bill but since that time, the bill has seen significant modification. Most importantly, the current bill does not authorize DNR's existing carbon, carbon project, nor does it allow carbon projects to be associated with improved forest management on state land. This is a major missed opportunity because protecting mature forests and incentivizing ecological forest management are perhaps the two most meaningful natural climate solutions we have at our disposal in Western Washington. DNR needs clear authority to move forward with carbon work in the future, and we hope the legislature provides that legislative authority in a future legislative session. We urge you to not advance this bill out of committee. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to call up uh, Michael Moran and Jared Michael Erickson, please. Good morning, Senator Wynn, members of the committee. Michael Moran, uh, state lobbyist for the Confederate Tribes of the Colville Reservation. I'd like to yield my time to Chairman Erickson, who's calling in from Inchley in Washington. Welcome, Chairman. 
Morning, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, uh, my name is Jared Michael Erickson. I serve as the chairman of the Confederate Tribes of Colville Reservation. Uh, we are in support of House Bill 1789. After the passage of the Climate Commitment Act, we're now see, seeing the, beginning, the beginnings of implementation. HB 1789 is the first step in creating contract opportunities for ecosystem service projects on public lands. Colville Tribe has seen almost half our 1.4 million acre reservation burn in wildfires since 2015. It is an understatement to say that we understand the impacts of climate change. We recognize that reducing greenhouse gas emissions and sequestering carbon through sustainable forest management are important tools to, co to combat those effects. This is an effort we must collectively participate in. As a committee, as the committee may be aware, there are significant DNR land holdings around the Colville Reservation. Any work to improve forest resilience, increase carbon storage capacity, and reduce fire and disease risk is a benefit to all people in the state. Look forward to seeing how this legislation moves forward in this session. As a matter of policy, the Confederated Tribes of the Culver Reservation further term protected tribal rights as opposed to the language treaty and reserve rights. Thank you, and I'm available for any questions. Any questions for the chairman? All right, thank you so much for joining us. If uh, I may add one more minute of testimony. Yes. Um, I think it's really imperative for this committee to know that the Colville tribe has faced hundreds of thousands of acres of damage to wildfires. They are not Colville owned trees. They are DNR land, USDA land, private forestry. You have to start somewhere. And all I'm in to please pass the bill. The really great thing about the legislature is you guys meet every year and you can fix things if they need improvement. But please pass the bill. You have to start somewhere. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our next panel will be Heath Heikla, Doug Cooper, and Bill Turner. Good morning, Senators. My name is Bill Turner, and I'm the Washington Timber Manager for Sierra Pacific Industries. Sierra Pacific is a family-owned forest products company, and, and in Washington, we operate four sawmills and two renewable biomass energy plants. The House bill before you today has been narrowed in scope from the original bill that we did not support. Sierra Pacific now supports this bill. This bill would authorize DNR into, in, to enter into carbon and ecosystem service markets for reforestation and afforestation on state trust lands. These types of products projects are additive in nature in that they will result in increased carbon sequestration by replanting burned over trust lands and create more working forests for the state of Washington. It's truly a win-win-win situation. More carbon sequestration, more working forests, and more locally sourced carbon-friendly building products. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, Chair Wynn and committee members. Heath Heikle here on behalf of the members of the American Forest Resource Council who produce renewable carbon-friendly wood products under some of the most stringent environmental protections in the world. AFRC supports ESHB 1789 and appreciates the significant effort by the other chamber, Commissioner Franz and others to get it into a form that came over from the House. As my members have noted, we believe the new authorities provided DNR an appropriate, careful first step into carbon and ecosystem services markets. We believe broad support exists for reforesting after wildfires, and it has clear environmental carbon and societal benefits. We are also support re restoring other non-controversial authorities like biochar that have been mentioned. We have appreciated the opportunities to discuss the legislation with Senator Lovelett and others in recent weeks. Our members are interested in continued discussions about the management of forests, wood products, and carbon. It's a topic that's not going away and as you read it in every IPCC report. So thank you for the time and the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Cooper. thank you, members of the committee. My name is Doug Cooper. I'm Vice President of Resources for Hampton Lumber. Hampton is a fourth generation family owned timber company with three sawmills in the Washington rural communities of Randall, Morton, and Darrington. Hampton Lumber supports ESHB 1789 it provides DNR a path to develop carbon projects that help restore forests, increase carbon sequestration, and that don't threaten to further reduce timber supply from DNR state trust lands. Our sawmills produce carbon-friendly wood products that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change identifies as part of the solution for reducing global carbon emissions. Those wood products also help address the affordable housing crisis facing our region. We appreciate the comments by members of this committee in support of the Washington forest product sector and rural economies, and the efforts by Commissioner Franz 
and the House to advance this bill that allows DNR to help restore forests and complement the benefits our company and employees are proud to provide. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our next panel will be Clayton Peterson, Sherry Dysart, and Mark Watrin. Uh, and also for the benefit of our audience, both uh, on Zoom and in person, uh, due to time constraints, we are gonna have uh, several of these bills will be heard on Friday. Instead, the remainder of the hearing and those bill, we're gonna to try to finish up this bill and 1175 today, which will leave us um, spilling over into Friday for 1433, 1390 and 1391. So apologies, even with one minute of testimony, it still goes very, <laughs> we still had a lot of people signed up for these bills. So, all right, uh, I, and is that Sherry? Excuse me, Senator, can I also oh, say something real quick? Yes, of course. Um, as a reminder, when those, the bill agenda is published for those three bills moving over to Friday. Testifiers need to sign in again. The links, uh, the access to the meeting, especially in Zoom, will not work again. So they need to do to look for that notification later today. Yes. So please look out in your email inboxes for those links so that you can come back and sign in to testify and and make sure that we we hear your testimony. Uh, Sherry, please go ahead. Good morning, Chair Wen and members of the committee. My name is Sherry Dysart. I live in Mason County, and I'm the issue chair for Forest with the League of Women Voters of Washington. I am testifying in opposition to HB 1789. I am speaking as the issue chair with the League, and I'm speaking from the perspective of my decision to become the issue chair for Forest. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Forest Management from Washington State University. I'm now retired, but worked as a with a privately owned timber company in Shelton for 30 years. My husband's a retired forester who owned and managed his own forest management company in Mason County. From that perspective, I am testifying with disappointment with the revision HB 1789. I've submitted written testimony to explain what I believe are the essential components in a carbon offset and ecosystem bill. It is written from the perspective of someone who cares deeply about the timber industry. We long-term viability of the industry means we need to face the global climate crisis and speak the truth about carbon sequestration in Thank forest. Thank you Washington. so much. Uh, Mark, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Nguyen and members of the committee. For the record, I am Mark Watron, a school director from Battleground Public Schools and a member of WASDA's Trust Lands Advisory Committee, here to testify on Substitute House Bill 1789 as other on behalf of WASDA. School directors appreciate the intent of this bill, most specifically how it works to increase revenue for trust beneficiaries. The opportunity to generate revenue on lands that otherwise aren't best serving the trust is exciting, and especially when we think about supporting our students to live and learn in healthy and sustainable environments. At face value, this feels like a huge win for trust beneficiaries. At the same time, we're still concerned that this bill has no guarantee to ensure maximized revenue for the trust. While the opportunity to sell carbon credits has significant revenue generating potential, the lack of flexibility in managing the contract for a 125 year period can be a significant risk. Amending the bill to early termination language is important to us because we believe locking out unforeseen future opportunities in the next 125 years may Thank be a Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no, 125 years is a long time and a minute is very short. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, our next panel will be uh, John Hookstra, Brett Greenwood, and Mariska Seskis. All right. Uh, is that John? Can't see. I need new glasses, clearly. I'm looking at the little. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mariska? Go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair, Mr. Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Mariska Ketchkesh, um, and I'm with the Washington Chapter of Sierra Club. And um, I'm also unfortunately testifying con uh, to this bill. Um, like others, we originally testified in favor of this bill when it was first introduced, but um, as it has gone through changes, feedback that I've gotten from our members across the state, including members in rural communities and in timber counties, is that this bill just doesn't go far enough, that it really does a disservice to the original intent of the bill, that it unnecessarily ties the hands of the DNR in order to do um, different types of ecosystem services projects. Um, in particular, 
Um, we really feel like it should be able to allow DNR's own carbon project that they proposed last year um, and really take advantage both of the financial and ecological benefits of our most carbon dense and mature forest in order to really do this right and to do it right right now. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Oh, hold on, hold on. Try turn it off and turn it on again. Your audio just came through like a cartoon character. How about now? That is much better. You're welcome for a little needed laugh this morning. I did that on purpose. Um, so thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Brett Greenwood. I serve the Executive Director of Business Operations and Student Support for the Cedar Woolley School District. We're located in Skagit County, and we have a student count of about 4,300. I'm here testifying other on House Bill 1789. Our district's share of the state forest revenue supports our general fund. Over the last few years, the funding has dropped from about 3 million a year to under 300,000 a year. This has had a direct impact on us and we've been forced to cut programs and trim district operations. We're concerned that this proposal will create additional uncertainty regarding how much will be available to operate our district. We appreciate new ideas to increase revenue opportunities. However, we have concerns about experimental proposals that introduce uncertainty for schools. As a district who receives timber revenues, we should have been consulted. We'd like to work in partnership with the DNR. For example, instead of giving them full authority to test this statewide, we think they should, have, they should engage in a pilot program. A more systematic approach would ensure Thank new you. concepts can be implemented. Thank you. I do have a question for you, though. So when you do not receive enough money, uh, what happens to your school district? Uh, well, we are a people business. Um, so unfortunately, we have to reduce staffing most, most, um, most often reduce staffing to make the ends meet. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. And our final panel for the day will be Diane Jones, Isaac Castema, and Tom Davis. Isaac, you can go ahead and begin. Hopefully Tom will be able to join us. I don't see him, but then we also have Diane online. All right. Good morning, members of the committee. Isaac Castema on behalf of Clean and Prosperous Washington. I want to acknowledge the tremendous work of the commissioner, prime sponsor Christine Reeves, and many stakeholders to refine this bill, adding sideboards that add greater confidence to trust land beneficiaries. Uh, the recent Climate Commitment Act auction results highlight the value of our in-state carbon market, $48.50 per ton. There are a wide range of offsets potential to lower cost of compliance while meeting our requirements for benefiting in-state ecosystems and tribal lands. Uh, engaging in this market can value, add value to trust land beneficiaries. Um, some items related to innovative protocols in the original bill were not incorporated in the House floor amendment, specifically urban forestry, marine restoration, and production and use of biochar for soil amendments. We understand these items do not upset the apple cart that Representative Reeves talked about earlier. Uh, we believe this bill is an important first step for DNR to engage in this new market, and we encourage the committee to move it forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And Diane. Well, good morning, Chair Joe Wynn and committee members. My name is Diane Jones. I live in Jefferson County, and I am speaking on behalf of the Northwest Progressive Institute. MPI supports 1789 as a good start as climate change, disease, and forest fires are increasing the challenges facing forest managers. This bill will give DNR a new, new tool and flexibility to help manage our forests to their best use, be it logging, wildlife benefits, carbon storage, and reducing wildfire risk. And this in turn will help DNR to better support local beneficiaries. It can help fund reforestation of over 100,000 acres of forest lands burnt in the last decade. It will allow conserving forest land that may have more value for wildlife, environment, and carbon storage. This bill will allow acquisition of some working forests that would otherwise be lost to development and keep them in logging. 1789 will allow DNR access to carbon credit markets, which will reduce the need for taxpayer support and critical resource investments. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, that was our final testifier. So with that, I'm going to close the public hearing on House Bill 1789 and reopen the public hearing on House Bill 1175 related to petroleum storage tanks. Uh, with us today, we have Greg Hannon, uh, Cassandra Garcia, and Peter Godlewski. Please proceed. 
We'd start with Cassandra, if that's okay. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Cassandra Garcia, and I'm the Deputy Director at PLEA, testifying in support of the bill. PLEA's reinsurance program was created in 1990. Um, since then, PLEA generally reinsures about 70 to 80% of all operating gas stations in Washington through insurance agreements with three companies. Most of these gas stations are small independent businesses. Despite the state reinsuring 925,000 of the $1 million policy, there are still significant barriers to getting cleanup sites to closure under the current program. The private insurers currently make all the claim and coverage decisions despite using the state's money. Sometimes even it includes settlements. This results in costlier claim payments, longer cleanups, and often PLEA even has to advocate on behalf of the owners with the insurance companies to try to get things moving. Finally, there's a real risk that the insurers will pull out of the market. Thank and, you. Uh, although for the benefit of our viewing audience, what does PLEA stand for? The Pollution Liability Insurance Agency. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, please proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Greg Hannon, representing the Western States Petroleum Association and speaking in favor of House Bill 1175. PLEA is a small agency, yet it punches above its weight in its effectiveness in addressing environmental issues associated with underground storage tanks. I'm just going to speak to one issue, which is the funding of the program. The bill report notes that the bill would increase the Petroleum products tax from 0.15 to 0.30. When the program was started in 1990, the PPT tax was 0.5%. The various reforms in the program have allowed the effectiveness to increase and the tax to be reduced. It was reduced from 0.5 to 0.3. Um, for several years and just incre decreased in ju July, last July to the current 0.15. In order to provide the program reserves required by the federal regulations and to implement the bill funding mechanisms, the tax needs to go back to the 0.3 level. WISPA supports this. There's also a reserve component that when it gets to a certain level, the tax shuts off when it falls below. This provides added effectiveness and also financial accountability to the program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, um, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Peter Godlewski with the Association of Washington Business also signed in support this morning. I won't repeat the comments that you've just heard. Uh, this is a good bill. Um, AWB is glad to support it. Um, this uh, does the good work of um, being uh, both uh, providing helpful protections for small business owners and also for the environment it has a record of helping clean up contaminated sites around the state. Um, this has been a good program. Uh, it's, we're hopeful to see it continue. I'd like to appreciate, uh, thank the work of the, co of the sponsors and the work of the House to move this bill out and encourage you to support the bill and pass it on forward so it can uh, keep going. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for this panel? Uh, Senator Wellman. Thank you so much. Uh, when uh, we were first uh, looking at the bill um, in the in the Senate, I was surprised by the number of independent small uh, one thinks of the large uh, signs that we see on the highway of gas stations that that must be owned by this uh, big corporation or that corporation. But it seems as though, if I'm correct, that most of them are actually small independents, and one thinks about at some point, I'm just asking, my vision is that at some point, these tanks are going to be taken out because those gas stations will not be providing gas. They may be charging stations, they may be hydrogen stations, they may be other things, as well as perhaps some gas. Um, and then we'll have a flood of, well, not a flood, it will be, we'll have these tanks all over. Am I correct in how the reason for this bill is importance right now? Yeah, we, we'd like to make sure that all those gas stations are cleaned up and in good shape for when any sort of transition happens. Yeah, I would agree. The, the program's been in existence since 1990, and we're making progress. But and, and I would respond that it's all of the above examples, but in particular, those stations that are convert, that are converting to other uses and have these legacy sites that are there that need to be addressed and cleaned up. Thank you. A follow-up question. Uh, this is this is for you. Currently, do we have a way of prioritizing the tanks that are leaking versus ones that are still structurally intact? Yeah. So that's the Department of Ecology has a UST program, and they regulate leaking tanks, and they will um, either require somebody to you know to stop the leak immediately, or um, they'll red tag them, and they no longer can receive deliveries of gasoline. Thank you. All right, uh, so I'm gonna call for Diana Carlin to start making her way up. And in the meantime, we'll take remote testimony from Cliff. 
You're still on mute though. <laughs> okay. There you go. Thank, thanks so much. I'm, I'm Cliff Swiggett representing Carbon Washington. And this morning we urge you to not pass this bill as written. We, we see it as a risk bailout and we believe that it'll leave Washington with thousands of abandoned polluted sites. Our top concern is the bill is moving forward without any rigorous analysis of future cleanup costs. So how can we have an insurance program without an estimate of the liabilities? It, it seems fiscally irresponsible. The bill is written caps cleanup funds between 15 and $30 million when the actual cleanup costs could be in excess of $1 billion. The funding's not even close. So let's please create a program that works. We totally agree with the intent here. And here's what we recommend. Commission an analysis that estimates the actual cleanup costs. Design the tax so that required cleanup funds are available. And establish minimum standards and adopt best practices for sites that are provided insurance. We urge you all, please do not pass this risk bailout. The time to subsidize fossil fuels is long past. So let's Thank take some you. time to design a program for the cleanup. Thank you so much. And Matthew. Uh, good morning. I'm Matthew Metz, co-executive director of Cultura, a nonprofit organization focused on moving beyond gasoline. CLIA is planning to take even the dirtiest gas stations with the oldest tanks, even tanks that are known to be leaking into the program. That is not insurance. That's a bailout. And what this bill will do is green light gas stations with those leaky tanks to operate. They need that insurance to operate and the private market isn't providing it. So they're coming to the state and saying, give us this insurance, which isn't really even insurance. And these stations are going to wind up leaking gasoline into the groundwater and endangering the health of people and animals across the state. By the mid 2030s, these contaminated business, uh, gas stations will be out of business. In each of your districts, there's gonna be like 40 or 50 gas stations without any money to clean it up. This is not an honest bill. And do you really think that, that WISPA is here today supporting this bill to help the environment? No, what they're here to do is pass the cost for cleaning up thousands of contaminated gas stations onto the taxpayer. Thank you. Uh, and I'll do a call for Clayton Peterson, just in case he's here. Did we have any questions from members? All right. Uh, Diana, please proceed. Good morning. I'm Diana Carlin here today representing the Washington Oil Marketers Association in support of House Bill 1175. We're a nonprofit trade organization serving the needs of the liquid fuel distribution market. We represent more than 90% of the distributors in Washington state selling gasoline, diesel, renewable fuels, lubricants, and heating oils. Our members are the small businesses, including full fuel stations um, that was discussed in this bill. Um, they are vital. Um, these programs are vital to their businesses because the private insurance is cost prohibitive and difficult to find. And has been mentioned by others, PLEA is a model program and this legislation just simply modernizes that program to make it more effective. PLEA has worked closely with my members um, and there's a lot of trust there. They provide great technical assistance and this legislation is gonna help them be even more effective and clean up more sites. Thank you for hearing this bill and thank you Senator Wellman for prime sponsoring it here in the Senate. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions? All right, with that, I'm gonna close the public hearing on House Bill 1175 and pass it back to our chair. Thank you so much, everybody. I know that the room got a little bit sparse. We weren't able to make, <laughs> make it for the last uh, three bills, but we will be hearing them on Friday. I'll personally send a note to all the folks who signed up and were not able to testify today as well to remind you and how to make that link work. Uh, otherwise, I appreciate it and have a great day. The meeting is adjourned.